so if you can talk first about um, talk about the biblical mandate of your job um, as dad, spiritual leader, husband, um, Deuteronomy six um, and so on, Ephesians six to to lead your family spiritually. Mm. You know, um, I haven't shared, but I'm a I'm in ministry at my church. I'm right now the college pastor at, at my church, um, and I'm also pursuing eldership. And, um, and it's something that I've considered doing for a long time. And one of the requirements for an elder is that he has to manage his household well. Um, and, and he's disqualified if his children are rebellious. Um, and I don't look at that and say, okay, this is only this elite group who actually manage their household well. The reason we have elders who have those qualifications is because we're supposed to imitate them. That's, that's the standard. That's what God expects of fathers. He expects them to be managing their homes well, um, and he expects their children to not be rebellious. Um, and and what I, what's really easy to happen in our American culture is the dad comes home and he's exhausted and he sits on the chair and he turns on the TV um, and, and that's the interaction the kids have with dad. Um, and mom manages the household. Um, that's not what it says in scripture. It says a, a man has to manage his own household well, um, which means when I come home from work, I'm constantly having to run by myself. I need to manage this. I need to see myself as the head of this. I need to be leading my family. Um, it, it's easy, I think, as men sometimes, especially, especially when we have, um, I think a lot of homeschool dads, have wives who are go-getters, who are phenomenal. They're educating their kids, they're raising children, they're managing their home. Um, and it's easy to sort of say, okay, you know, you do your thing and I'll sit back because you're doing an amazing job. Um, but we can't do that. We have a God-given responsibility to be the head. Um, what that means is I have a responsibility to show my children how much Christ loves the church by how I love my wife. And, and that's the first way I do it. When I come home showing affection to my wife, showing my wife I love her, um, giving her priority, not prioritizing my children. Um, I think sometimes in homeschool families, it's easy. We've made this decision to really put our children as the focus of our home and we can forget about each other. Um, but if I'm not showing my children how much Christ loves the church by how intentional I am, with my wife, um, it's like gonna all fall apart. And, and so I come home and, and I focus on that first. I focus on, I need to love my wife. I need to show her affection. Um, and a big part of that is just figuring out how does she feel loved? How do I communicate love to her? She is words of encouragement and, and affection. Like that's what she needs. So she needs me to show her physical touch, affection, and she needs to hear from my lips you've done a wonderful job today. You are a wonderful mom. You are a great wife. And, and just, she needs to hear those things. And my kids need to hear me saying those things. Um, and, then, and then I get to focus on my children. And, and for me, I, I love the time after dinner where we just get to gather around and, and read. We'll read um, stories. We've read through all the Ralph Moody books, if you're familiar with those, Little Britches and Man of the House. Um, and we've read through Little House on the Prairie, and we've read some of Tolkien, we've read C.S. Lewis, and, and just a lot of what homeschoolers would consider the classics. Um, we've read those aloud, but, but then just spending time in the Word, where I'm reading God's Word and I'm teaching it to my children. Um, I have a passion for teaching God's Word, so I just love to open it up and read it to my kids and share with them from it. I, I love this time of year. We're going through um, our Advent reading right now, and, and we have a story we read, but each night I just give them a different word for Advent, um, a different character quality that we have because of what Christ did. Um, also, as the leader in my home, um, I, I have been very convicted that I need to make sure I'm pursuing my daughter's hearts. Um, as a public school teacher, I have teenage girls all day long who are really just sort of throwing themselves at me like they need a dad. Um, they're desperate for a dad. There's hardly any who actually have a dad. And those who do have a dad hardly see him or he doesn't give them the time of day. And they just crave that father's love. 
they just crave that father's affection. And so one of the things I do is I give each of my daughters a, a date night once a month. Um, and so they, they have assigned a month in the calendar year where they get their date night and they get to choose what we're gonna do and we'll go out and, and they, they have me for the night. And the main thing is I just gotta give them my face and my ear. I just sit down, we go get ice cream and they just talk and talk and I just listen to them and I affirm them and I encourage them. Um, and, and I'm confident that as I do that and somebody else comes along someday who pursues their heart um, they're going to want me to be in on that. I'm going to be a part of that automatically because um, I have a piece of their heart as, as their dad. Um, we come to know our Father through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit's poured onto our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, and He teaches us who our Heavenly Father is. And what a privilege I have as a dad to image that. It's the Holy Spirit who's going to teach that to my daughters, but I get to show them what it looks like. Um, in, in ministry, I know it can be overwhelming for, for men in ministry sometimes to balance. I hear a lot of guys talking about, you know, how do I balance family life and, and ministry? And I, and I think it's the wrong, the wrong focus. I heard a message um, by Francis Chan one time on focus on the family, and the title of the message was, Don't Focus on the Family. Um, and and he, he wasn't saying just forget about your children. What he was saying is if we focus on mission as a family, we'll draw closer than any other family. Um, and, and I found that in my own life. So as a college pastor, I have the college students in my home and my children are there. And when those college students come in and my kids need me and I prioritize them over those students, that's communicating something to that students that I can't teach them. I can preach till I'm red in my, in my face, but when I get to stop and focus and love my children in front of these college students, they see the Father's heart. And a lot of them haven't seen that in their own homes. They get an opportunity to see, this is how God loves me. Um, when I, I coach um, cross country at my public, public high school and I invite those kids into my home and when they come into my home and they see me with the, my kids, that's the gospel. That's the gospel in front of them. For God so loved the world, they get to see the Father's heart through my ministering to them. They get to see the bridegroom love of Christ through my love for my wife. Um, and so inviting them into my life is part of me even leading my family. I'm leading my family in front of people, and it's intentional because that's, that's how we show Christ. It, Paul says it's a mystery, but this mystery is Christ and the church, and that's what my wife and I get to show as we go through this life together, displaying to the world the perfect love of Christ, which is impossible, but we have our moments, and it's such a joy. And that's the key, is to let the joy of what you get to do, of what you're privileged to do, um, be what propels you and what compels you to be that ambassador for Christ. Um, what do you think the role is of the church? So you're involved in ministry, of course. Um, what do you think the role is of the church in regards to supporting families? Yeah, I, I like the word that you used. You said, what's the role of the church in supporting the family? And that's it. The church is a support. Um, I, uh, I heard a a message from a youth pastor at Grace Community Church here in um, Sun Valley. And, um, and he, he talked about um, parents that he has to sort of teach what youth group is for. Um, and, and he has these parents who will sort of drop their kids off and it's like, all right, um, he calls it kick it to the curb parenting, right? They, they pull in the parking lot, the kid comes out and you better fix them because we don't know what we're doing. Uh, we only just became Christians, so how can we disciple these children? Um, and he views himself not as a discipler of children, but as a support to parents. Um, and that's how I think the church needs to view themselves. I think for some churches that means they need to be family integrated because they can't see themselves as a support unless they integrate. I think for other churches, they can use a different model and still see themselves that way. I don't, I don't think that um, there's a formula for doing it. I don't think that we can see in scripture that it says you have to do church this way or you're doing it wrong. I think there's a little bit of freedom there for how we do it. 
But what's key is that the church understands what its role is and that they don't take away from the spirit what he's convicting parents of. One of the most dangerous things is to quench that conviction of the spirit. The spirit for every, every parent, when they see that newborn baby, he is communicating to them, this is a gift from God to you. Use it for his glory. Raise this child for his glory. Bring this child up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Raise him up on the way he should go so that when he's old, he doesn't depart from it. And that, that spirit just puts that, that weight on your shoulders and then he compels you with the joy of what you're getting to do and what God has entrusted you with. And if the church comes in and says, oh, you know what? You don't know what you're doing. Let us take over for you. And, and they don't communicate that directly. But if they're communicating that indirectly with any of their ministries, then those, those ministries are going to be for naught. Those ministries are going to be ineffective because they're going to break down the family, which is how God has designed the church to work. At the same time, it's imperative that we as parents are intentional about teaching our children that they're a part of the body of Christ. Um, it, it's tempting to keep our children to ourself. Um, my, my oldest is 11 and she's getting to the point now where she wants to, she wants to serve in the church. And, and there's a part of me sometimes that wants to keep her at home. I want you to stay here. I want you to serve me. I want you to serve in our home. We need you helping here. But her heart is she wants to minister and, and recognizing for me, she is a part of the body of Christ just as much as I am. And so giving her those opportunities to stretch her wings a little bit and to learn how to serve within the churches is important. It's also important that I recognize that while I'm the primary discipler, there's other voices that can speak into my children's lives. There's other people that can come alongside and can say something that maybe I wouldn't think of saying. The, the body, which includes our children, needs the body. And I can't always give my children everything they need. They need the body. And it's tempting sometimes to think because I have this responsibility to be the discipler, I'm the only one who's allowed to speak to my children. I'm the only one who's allowed to teach my children. And there's something lost when we remove them from the richness of that body life where, no, I want them to go out there. I want them to hear what other people are teaching. I want them to interact with other Christians. I want them to then come back and tell me what they, what they learned, what they heard. I want us to be able to talk through it together. But I don't want them to think that they need me to grow spiritually. I am teaching them to depend on the Spirit not to depend on me. And one of the ways I do that is by teaching them to integrate themselves into the body of Christ, not just you're only integrated into our family and then I decide what everything else is gonna be as far as ministry is concerned. I let them make some of those decisions. I let them be taught by other people and I'm intentional about knowing what they're learning and interacting with them about it. But it's so important that I recognize they're a member of the body and the body needs them I need them. And it's so, it's so beautiful to see your own children side by side. Um, I, I remember um, when I was a teenager one time, my dad called me bro. And I was like, that was, that was weird. It was sort of a Freudian slip for him, but I was realizing, you know, he's starting to see me as, as a brother in Christ, you know? Um, and, and my mom, she, she text messaged me a question from her Bible reading this morning, you know, um, because she's starting to see me as a teacher in her life. And it's such, it's, it's so neat to see how, you know, they bring you up on the way you should go, right? And then you get to speak truth into their life. And my children are young, but they're still starting to, they're still starting to do that. They're starting, I'm, I'm learning things from them. That's such a pleasure. It's so cool because you think about your kids being able to serve in ministry and if they were in a traditional school where they'd be for six, seven hours a day and then go home and have, you know, two to four hours of homework at night, um, they would they would miss opportunities. Yes, there there's so much wasted time in, in a regular school day. Um, it's it's uh, for, for me as an educator, it's very frustrating. Um, but it, the reason there's so much wasted time is because there's so many people. 
And when you have a whole bunch of people and you're managing a whole bunch of people, you're going to lose a lot of time. And that's the beauty of homeschool. And, and I think that um, homeschool parents need to remember the advantage you have as a homeschool parent, you don't need to waste time. You don't need to think, oh, well, everybody else is going just in school from 7.30 to 2.30, so we better make sure we're in school from 7.30 to 2.30. They're not in school from 7.30 to 2.30. During that time, maybe 45 minutes to 90 minutes is actually spent with rich learning experience. The rest of it is just wasted time and those kids come home exhausted and then they have work to do whereas a homeschooler they wake up they get to start their homework and they get to be done by noon and have time to do other things have time to integrate into the church and minister and recognize what's really important is that school the time after school yeah, yeah and and that's that's key and that's one of the, the things that happens with homeschoolers is they they realize that life is their classroom. Um, I, I had many times where I'd be teaching junior high um, and I would ask the students questions or I would break them into groups and I'd have them do some sort of assignment, some sort of group assignment where I wanted them to engage God's word and think about it for themselves. And I would constantly get back from my public school students in the junior high, this isn't school. This isn't school, right? And the, the homeschoolers are looking at them like, well, what's, what, what is their problem? Like, we're everywhere you go, you're learning. What do they mean this isn't school? They're like, I'm off the clock now, right? I've, I've checked out. I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, it's time for my brain to be turned off. And, um, and that, that's, that's the key, I think, for homeschool parents is to recognize that turning your brain off isn't fun. Um, that's the lie that my students have bought into in the public school system is that they want to get to that point where they can just sort of amuse themselves, where you can get to the end of the day and you can turn your brain off. Um, it's not fun to have your brain turned off. You don't need to turn your brain off to go to, you know, to, to unwind in the evening. Reading a book that challenges you can be extremely relaxing. Um, listening to a lecture um, before you go to sleep can be very enjoyable. Um, and if you have a passion for learning, that's, that's what you're gonna choose uh, instead of just choosing to do things that are gonna amuse you so you don't have to think. Um, and and that's, the, that's the, the danger in our culture is so much of our culture has this focus on we need to entertain ourselves. We need to amuse our brains so we don't have to think because it's so tiring to think. It's not tiring to think. Um, we, we make the choice to stress out over thinking really what's what's tiring is trying to impress everybody all day long with our thoughts. Um, and I think that sometimes homeschoolers don't buy into that. Um, they're not they're not out there worrying so much about what people are thinking about them all the time and saying the right thing. That's what's exhausting. Um, thinking is not exhausting. Although I am an introvert, so I do enjoy time inside my own head. I have to admit that. Um, talk about, you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, you guys do your dinner time and then you will spend time reading together as a family um, and reading the Bible together. Um, do you have a, for lack of a better word, format that you use for doing like a family devotion time with your kids? And because I know a lot of dads would say, well, I don't know how to do family devotions. I don't know how to um, teach the Bible to my kids. I don't know, and, and you're in ministry and you grew up in a homeschool family, so it comes very naturally for you to be able to do that. How would you encourage other dads to be able to do that with their kids if they're not as, you know, maybe they're new believers or, you know, whatever, and they're just not as experienced? How can yeah. you, how, how would you teach a dad who would ask you, how in the world do I do this? What I would say to a dad who's struggling with um, family devotions is, um, wouldn't it be wonderful if Jesus could just come to us and tell us exactly what to say to our family? Wouldn't it be great if maybe some of the people who, who lived when Jesus was alive and walked around with him and saw everything could come in and just sort of teach us what, what we're supposed to do? We have that. We have God's word. Um, and so often we feel as, as dads inadequate to disciple our children because we are. And our, our words are always going to have errors. Um, whenever I, I write a sermon or I, I teach a Bible study, 
afterwards, I always think about all the mistakes. Um, uh, I'll have people come up to me and they'll say, you know, I said, you said this. I don't, I don't know if that's quite true. And, and I'll have to admit, yeah, I made a mistake. And I'll never preach a perfect sermon. I'll never teach a for perfect Bible lesson. But when I read God's word, my words are perfect. And what a privilege. Discipling your children means dedicating yourself to the reading of God's word. And, and, and I love um, that we could, we have the, the prophetic word made sure. Um, God has preserved it for us. And he tells us over and over again, that's where the power lies. It's not in you. I mean, we receive with meekness the implanted word, which does what? It's able to save our souls, right? The word of God is perfect, David says in the Psalms, converting the soul. Like what's gonna convert my children to Christianity? It's God's word, it's not my words. And so what, what I get to do, if I can read, I can disciple. And, and all that means is I open that book up, God's word, and, and I read it to my children. But I read it confidently. I read it knowing this is where faith comes from. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's not about me being a great teacher. I mean, Paul said that his words were not anything to be desired, but you read what he wrote, that's God's word. That's the implanted word. That's the word that brings faith by hearing it. And that's all that I need to do as a dad. Um, yeah, I, I can speak eloquently about it. I can do those things and it's so natural for me because I grew up memorizing it to think of scripture and to repeat those to my children. And I encourage every dad that if all, the, if all of your time in the word is reading it to your family, that's part of your problem. You need to be in that word yourself. You need to be passionate about it. If you really want your children to love Jesus, you need to demonstrate that by reading what he's written to you. And as you read that, it'll start to flow. It'll start to flow through you. And all, all you do, you just dedicate yourself. Dedicate, that's the word that Paul used, dedicate yourself to the reading of God's word. And, and think about those early churches as they gathered weekly, all they had were these letters and they would just read them because they knew these were true. Because everybody was a new believer. Nobody had it all together, but they had these letters from those guys who were with him. And so they would read them. And, and the, the second thing I encourage dads with is this. Jesus said, before he left, he told the disciples, they're disrought. Jesus is leaving them. And he said, it's better if I go. And, and, and if you just stop and think about that, I mean, maybe, you, maybe you've heard it before, but if you stop and think about that, so often we read Jesus' words and we think of them as hyperbole. Uh, because we do that. Well, uh, I, I heard recently that the, the word literally now in the dictionary, there's actually a definition of it meaning figuratively, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so like we're the masters in American culture today of, of nothing really means what, we, what we're saying. If Jesus said something, he meant it. So when Jesus said, it's better if I go, he's not like, you know, my grandma when she's on her deathbed saying, it's better if I go, right? No, he means it. He means it's genuinely better if I go. This is going to be better for you. For me to not be on the earth anymore is going to be better for you. For you, not having me standing next to you is going to be better for you. And why? Well, he gives the answer. He says, because then the comforter can come. Because then the Holy Spirit can come. And, and the amazing blessing we have, every single dad has this. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. That's crazy. John tells us you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. You, you know everything you need to know. You have it right now because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. So Jesus taught us the Holy Spirit inside of you is better than me right there telling you what to do. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And so what I, I encourage men to do when they disciple their family, when they do family devotions, is trust God's word and trust the Spirit inside of you. Um, and for me, part of that is I don't, I don't always have a plan. Usually I'm just reading through a book. I'm reading through the Psalms. We love to read through the Proverbs during the summer. That's just something that, that we started doing. Um, and, and I like to pair it with some other book that we're reading. We'll usually read some, some fiction and then I'll read God's word. And my kids are talkers. Um, my kids have so much personality. It just, it's, it's weird for me to be in my home because I'm from a family of nine children and all of my siblings were introverts and all of my kids are not. 
Um, and so they love to talk about God's word. And I'll just read it to them and then ask some questions. And, and they, I've taught them to raise their hands because I'm a school teacher, but every hand is up. They all have something they want to say. Even my three-year-old who can't quite speak yet, she wants to say something about what I just now read. Um, and we just talk about it. And I trust as I read God's word and as I depend on the Holy Spirit, that's going to be effective. That's going to bring faith because God's word doesn't ever return to him void. It always accomplishes what he sends it out for. And I can trust that. I don't have to trust in my own skills or abilities. I can trust his word and the Holy Spirit inside of me. Awesome. You have any more? No? I think that was, that was it. I do have one more. Okay. This is, uh, and I know you've hit on this several times throughout. Uh, and this is just a philosophical question. It's not about your family. Mm -hmm. Why homeschool? What makes homeschool worthwhile? Why homeschool? Hmm. You know, the question of why homeschool is essential to this conversation because if you don't know the answer to that question, you're going to give up. Um, I, I run marathons for fun. Um, and every time I get to about mile 22, I start asking why. And if I don't have an answer before the race starts, I'm not going to finish. Um, it's, for me, part of the reason I, I run a marathon is because I want to stay fit and um, I, I enjoy racing. It's fun. Um, and then lastly, when I'm really there close to the end, it's, well, I've already spent the money, so I better finish and get my medal, right? Um, when, when you're in the thick of things, it's going to be so easy to quit if you haven't counted the cost, right? Jesus teaches us you don't build the tower if you don't first count the cost. You don't go to war if you don't go and figure out, you know, can we win this? Is this something we can do? Um, so I think every single family needs to answer that question before they start. They need to have an answer for themselves. And it's so important that that's not something that you're doing because everybody around you does it. You go to a church where everybody homeschools, so you better homeschool. Um, you're not doing it because you were raised homeschooling and that's just what you do. Um, you need to have a reason to homeschool or you're gonna give up on it. You're not gonna stick with it. Um, and so I think for everybody, that's, that's a question they have to ask themselves and that's, a, that's an answer they have to find for themselves. Um, I think that it's possible um, to be intentional about discipling your children without homeschooling them. Um, but for me, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to be intentional about discipling my children. I don't know how to raise my children to prepare them for the, the spiritual warfare that lies ahead without homeschooling them. As, as a public school teacher, um, the public schools are the cesspool of our society. Our society has gone downhill. And when you go into a public school, you have these children who are raised by people with no morals and every single generation is compounded. And I've been, I've been doing this for 14 years and every single year it's been compounded. Um, these children have no morals at all. And um, if, if, if parents think it's difficult in the workplace to be surrounded by pagans, Imagine their children without those pagan parents there to do anything about it. Um, it's chaos. And, and, and teachers have their hands completely tied. And we've removed any consequence for any, um, any misbehavior at all. Um, and, and so it's just, just horrible what children do to each other. Um, it's horrible um, the things that children say to each other. Um, and I don't raise my children because I'm going to preserve them from the Lord, from the world. I raise my children to prepare them to engage the world. Um, and, and so by the time they're grown, they should be able to handle going to um, Cal State Berkeley or Stanford or Harvard and, and facing everything this world has to offer, but they'll be equipped to face it. And, and part of that means I'm intentional about exposing them to things in the world with me there. To encourage them, um, one of one of the things that um, I really appreciate about my parents is they stuck us in all sorts of sports 
teams and sports leagues from a really young age. And they, they would, we'd be on these, these city leagues for swimming. We'd be on the swim team and we'd be on the, the city team for basketball. And I played little league and all that stuff. And, and as we were doing that, we're exposed to, you know, we, we learned all the bad words that were out there. We learned all sorts of things that I'm sure my parents didn't really want us to learn those things, but they knew we had to deal with them, but they're always right there. And we had an open relationship, so we would dialogue about those things, and they would prepare us for how to handle those things. As a homeschool graduate, I have a lot of peers whose parents didn't do that. And they turned 18, 19, 20, and if they moved out of their home, um, which a lot of them didn't, but those who did, their faith was shipwrecked. They had no ability at all to deal with the things in the world because they'd never faced it in their life. They'd, they'd been so sheltered that they hadn't been prepared. And so homeschooling works when we're intentional about equipping our children to engage with the world and then giving them those opportunities. Um, as, as somebody who's ministered in youth ministries in my church for years, um, it breaks my heart when homeschool parents keep their kids out of the youth group because they're afraid of what the youth group might do to them. What, what I think ch parents should be doing is bringing their kids to that youth group so their kids can learn to evangelize the lost. Because what better venue to do it in than in the church, right? It's hard to you know, go door to door or you know, maybe just send them off on some sports team. I'm sure it's hard for my parents. But if there's, there's that, at that youth group, you have unchurched kids coming in you could bring your kids and you could teach them how to share the gospel. And then you can stay there and you can watch them do it. And you can talk to them afterwards about how it went. If you're, if you're never having your children evangelize, you're not discipling them. The, the greatest commission that Jesus gave us is missing from their diet. How can, how can you do that? You need to find opportunities, ways to do that. So, so when you answer that question, why homeschool? Make sure it's not because I'm going to prevent my children from engaging with the world. It's because you're gonna prepare your children to engage with the world. You're gonna be intentional about it and you're gonna use homeschooling to make them the, the brightest light that they can be for the kingdom of God. <laughs> you, Good job. You can take your mic off and drop it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Caleb, that was awesome. Really, really good, man.